compound can be selectively separated from other compounds or impurities in a solution by extracting it from the original solvent into another solvent. This procedure is commonly referred to as a solvent extraction, or just extraction. An important requirement is that the two solvents must be immiscible, so that they form two separate layers, as we see here in this diagram. And for the extraction process to be selective, the desired compound must be considerably more soluble in the second solvent than in the first, and the impurities must be insoluble in the second solvent. Once the second solvent is added to the first, the two layers are shaken vigorously so as to maximize the surface area between them and allow the transfer of the desired compound. When the transfer has occurred, the two layers are again allowed to form as shown here. Now note that some of the desired compound will always be left behind in the original solvent with the impurities. Repeated extractions with additional second solvent is necessary to remove more of the desired compound. It's worth noting at this stage a similar process to extraction called washing. Shown here, it is actually the reverse of extraction, where impurities are removed from the first solvent to the second solvent, leaving the desired compound in the original solvent. More often than not, workup procedures in the organic chemistry lab involve both extraction and washing, although they may collectively be referred to as solvent extraction. Now, when we perform extractions using TENS or hundreds of milliliters of solvents, we make use of a specially designed piece of apparatus called a separatory funnel, or just separating funnel, and often we just say SEP funnel for short. These pear-shaped separating funnels are equipped with a stopcock at the restricted end, and this allows for careful removal and separation of the lower layer from the upper layer. But if you're performing microscale organic chemistry where just a few milliliters of solvent are used, extraction and washing processes will be performed in centrifuge tubes or conical vials as shown here. This video shows separations using larger macroscale volumes in a separatory funnel. Nevertheless, the concepts will still be useful to microscale separations. It's always important to be able to identify the solvent in each layer. Non-polar hydrocarbons and ethers are less dense than water, or dilute aqueous solutions used in extractions. So when hydrocarbons and ethers are used in extractions with aqueous solutions, the water layer will be the bottom layer, as shown here. A halogenated hydrocarbon, such as dichloromethane, however, is more dense than water, so if dichloromethane is used in an extraction with an aqueous solution, the water layer will be on top. For more information on the theory of solvent extraction, you should consult an organic text or your lab manual and lab guide. In this demonstration of solvent extraction, we are going to extract a dissolved species, called the solute, from this aqueous solution into an organic solvent. As mentioned earlier, the extraction will be done using a separatory funnel, or SEP funnel, which is first placed on a ring support. The stopcock is closed and some water is added to the SEP funnel to make sure there are no leaks. The aqueous solution, which comprises the solute we need to extract, dissolved in water, is transferred to the SEP funnel. In solvent extraction, we must use two immiscible liquids. Dichloromethane is a good choice for this extraction because it's immiscible with water and the desired solute is considerably more soluble in dichloromethane than it is in water. As we can see from this graphic, the desired substance, the solute, is much more soluble in dichloromethane than water, so it can be extracted from the aqueous solution into the dichloromethane with relative ease. We should also note that the density of the dichloromethane is greater than that of water, and since the two solvents are immiscible, water will float on top of the dichloromethane. Indeed, it's good practice and prudent to always check the densities of solvents used in solvent extraction so that we know which layer is on top and which layer is on the bottom. 
So we begin the extraction process by adding the required amount of dichloromethane to the aqueous solution in the SEP funnel. The stopper is now placed in the neck of the SEP funnel. It's important for you to not allow the stopper to fall out at any time while you are handling the apparatus. Hold the stopper with one hand and carefully invert the apparatus. Now gently shake the SEP funnel while periodically opening the stopcock to relieve the buildup of pressure. This is repeated several times to ensure that the two layers are thoroughly mixed, allowing the solute to transfer from the water into the dichloromethane. Then, with the stopcock closed, the SEP funnel is returned to the ring support and the two layers are allowed to separate. Here we can see the denser dichloromethane layer on the bottom and the water layer is on the top. However, it's better not to assume which layer is which and you may be given instructions on how to determine which layer is which. The stopper is removed from the SEP funnel, a suitable container is placed underneath and the stopcock is opened, allowing us to collect the bottom dichloromethane layer. Watch carefully as the interface between the two layers moves towards the stopcock so that you are able to stop the flow once the entire lower layer has been removed. Partially close the stopcock to restrict the flow and watch carefully. You will achieve a good separation if you close the stopcock just as the interface flows into the top part of the stopcock. The procedure could call for a second extraction, in which case some more dichloromethane would be added to the SEP funnel and the extraction process would be repeated. Several extractions with relatively small portions of solvent are more efficient than doing just a single extraction with a larger volume of solvent. When you are finished with the upper layer, it is poured out of the top of the funnel. You should pay attention to your script in the lab manual and follow whichever procedure is given. Here we are going to dry the organic dichloromethane layer using anhydrous sodium sulfate and this will remove any traces of water. Other drying agents which could be used include calcium chloride and magnesium sulfate. Removal of small amounts of water is usually necessary after extraction from an aqueous solution. Follow whichever directions you're given. We wait a minute or two and then observe. If the drying agent forms clumps, as shown here, it means that the solution is still wet and more drying agent is required. And when you see a snowstorm effect like this, it means that the solution is now dry and there are no traces of water present. Now, sometimes it's difficult to see a snowstorm effect, but you should be able to see that there are no longer any clumps of drying agent. The drying agent can then be removed by gravity filtration, and then you can follow any further directions on how to proceed. So that's about it for solvent extraction in this video. Remember that we've had a look at only the basic procedures, so it's important for you to follow the directions given in your lab manual and by your lab instructor for any specific experiment which involves solvent extraction. For more instructional videos on techniques used in the chemistry lab, don't forget to check out our YouTube channel at Capilano U Chem Lab or get a full listing of our videos from our website at capuchem.ca slash labs. And thanks again for watching.